Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you on this muggy day that God has made. Welcome here to Christ Church, whether you're here in person, whether you are concurrently viewing us during Zoom, or whether you're frustrated at me because we're not streaming on YouTube, but it will be uploaded later. So if you're watching from some distant time or place on YouTube, welcome to our service today. It's a great pleasure to be back. It was a wonderful Confirmation Sunday with uh, Calvary United Methodist over in Latham last week, but I am happy and more comfortable here than I was over there, stuffy in my robe and all the rest. So thank you for those who put together that wonderful service last week, and thank you for continuing to be here today, even though many of you are traveling this week. So as we continue on a journey with Christ questioning, serving, and growing, I invite you to, to hear this combination of things that I've put together as a call to worship. This is both uh, a, a prayer resource and a, uh, a statement of forgiveness from UMC Discipleship that seemed appropriate for this week. You tell us it is enough for us to be like you. Yet we are overwhelmed and discouraged by the injustice that surrounds us and our seeming inability to do anything about it. How are we supposed to be like you, all-powerful God, when we feel so powerless? You tell us not to fear those who can kill the body but not the soul, yet the violence in the world threatens to deaden our hearts, and that scares us. How are we supposed to resist fear when threats seem to abound on all sides? You tell us we are more of more value than sparrows, yet we notice so many in our neighborhoods and our world who are treated as less than human, even less than a sparrow. How are we supposed to restore dignity to all those whom the world has devalued? You tell us to tell in the light what we receive in the dark, to shout from the rooftops what is whispered in secrets. In the face of the world's suffering, violence, and despair, whisper in our hearts that we may learn to grow as your disciples who declare in the light the love and goodness of God with our voices and our lives. God has opened our ears and our hearts to know the love and forgiveness only our Creator can provide. There is nothing we need to do other than love one another and love God for all things to come from God's love. Let us begin worship knowing you have been forgiven and you are restored in God. Let us worship that we may live in the way of Christ. And with that, I'll invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing our opening hymn. It's uh, number 2246, Deep in the Shadows of the Past.
microphone somewhere. Are there joys or concerns you have to share with one another today? Yeah, Nancy. First of all, I'm glad Pastor Paul is back so we get to hear him instead of us. Um, <laughs> um, secondly, for those of you who have been following the saga of Tim and his electric car, after four months, he finally has it back and it runs. Yay! Yeah, finally. And also, I'd like a prairie, uh, prayers for my friend Heather, who got blood uh, blood infection and is now in rehab and is probably going to go stir crazy before she's let out. <laughs> Are there any other joys or concerns? Yes. Hello. Here too. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, this is great for me. <laughs> no. uh, last Sunday, I could not make it to church, but I did watch it on the television, and I thought it was fantastic, really fantastic. Everybody did a good job. And I have their names, but I remember. There's Alice, Marilyn, Bob, Ken, Lee, Ron, and Nancy, and myself while I was there, but that's okay. <laughs> Bless you all. That was fantastic. Bye bye. Love you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I'll get Bruce and then I'll come the rest of the way to Alice. Concern for my uh, cousin Beverly, who's 88 and having major uh, dental work done this Wednesday in operation. And uh, I know all the complications that can come from that, and i just say a prayer for her. And the sun is shining outside. For those who didn't know, it's supposed to be raining and the sun is shining. So let's all go out and dance in the sun. Got that from a book I've been reading. It's a good book. Prayers for Richard and his family. I have a celebration. Our kitchen and bathroom are being demoed tomorrow. So that is a good thing. <laughs> celebration that your progress is making, or project is making progress. Prayers for uh, being able to cook. <laughs> I'm Andrew, and um, I thank you for the pastor here. I thank you for all of you helping me out. Um, this is a new beginning, and it's I'm a little scared, but it's still like um, I'm happy to be peaceful and like and starting the beginning with my God, and like I'm so happy that I can like start over and like have my Savior Jesus Christ, and you guys are the greatest. Are there any other joys or concerns? Not seeing any, I'll invite you to, to join me in an attitude of prayer. As, as I finish this prayer, I'll invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me. I invite you to say that familiar prayer, however you first learned or however you're most comfortable. But let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, thank you for bringing all of us together today. Whether we're worship, watching from afar, whether we're here in person, thank you for this inexplicable community that you have gathered. God, there's so much to celebrate as the summer goes on. There's so much to mourn as we engage in activities, missing the friends who've joined us in the past. God, for all those who are finding new diagnoses and facing daunting treatments, offer your comfort and your grace. For all those who are mourning the loss of a loved one and finding grief coming up in different ways with every season, offer your presence and your compassion. And as we look around at each other and see the challenges of life, may we be blessed with the tenacity to continue to reach out and support. May we continue 
to look to you that we may be guided to have your comforting words and your grace as we engage with each other. God, remind us, though, to continue to show up in celebration. Life is hard. You know life is hard. You remind us that Jesus celebrated with the disciples even after the resurrection. May we have some of that uncrushable spirit that we may rejoice in praise and thanksgiving to you, but also for all the little things in life that you call us together to celebrate. God, as we continue to look at the ways that some of the forebears of our faith got things wrong, may we remember to have grace for ourselves, and may we remember to be gentle as we continue to figure out what it is you call us to in this world and how exactly we ought to be building your kingdom here on this earth. As we hold all of this together, let us pray the prayer that Jesus prayed with his disciples as we say, Our God, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. With that, I'll invite you to spend a few minutes gently sharing the peace of Christ with each other this morning. This is something we enjoy. It usually takes a bit of time, but again, pause for a moment, discern how the person you're greeting would like to be greeted, whether it's with a handshake, a hug, or just a very passive peace. But let us gently engage the peace of Christ together today.
Well, we'd probably better continue with the service here. I know. Our scripture for this week is uh, Genesis 21, verses 8 to 21. Two weeks ago, we uh, started with the beginning of Abraham's story. This is a continuation of Abraham's story, and next week we'll continue on later in Genesis as we continue walking through these less told parts of the Hebrew Bible throughout the summer. But I encourage you to, to hear these awkward verses from Genesis this morning. The child grew, and on the day of weaning, Sarah and Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah noticed the child that Hagar, the Egyptian, had born for Abraham, playing with her child Isaac. She demanded of Abraham, send Hagar and her child away. I will not have this child of mine attendant share in Isaac's inheritance. Abraham was greatly distressed by this because of his son Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, don't be distressed about the child or about Hagar. Heed Sarah's demands, for it is through Isaac that descendants will bear your name. As for the child of Hagar the Egyptian, I will make a great nation of him as well, since he is also your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham brought bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar. Then placing the child on her back, he sent her away, and she wandered off into the desert of Beersheba. When the skin of water was empty, she set the child under a bush and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away. She said to herself, don't let me see the child die. And she began to wail and weep. God heard the child crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. What is wrong, Hagar? The angel asked. Don't be afraid, for God heard the child's cry. Get up, lift up the child, and hold his hand, for I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went to it and filled the skin with water, and she gave the child a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became a fine archer. He made his home in the desert of Paran, and his mother found a wife for him in Egypt. Hear what the Spirit's saying to you this day. Amen. So, I appreciate the lectionary for many reasons. I would not have picked this passage if it weren't for the lectionary, and I'm appreciative for all of the support from all the other pastors of different denominations that contribute their thoughts around these readings. This is an awkward passage, and it's surrounded by other awkward passages for the week. The, there's this reading for Genesis. There is a lament psalm. There's an apocalyptic text from Jeremiah. There's another lament psalm. There's some theology of sin from Romans and Matthew's conversation on Jesus' words against family and taking up one's own cross. None of these are very easy passages to preach on, but they're all fairly important in their own way. It bears in mind how we frame these passages. They're either things that can further connect us to God and each other, or they're things that can put us down and depress us at times in making us not as confident or not as self-assured. It's important how we subtitle this passage, whether it's titled as Hagar and Ishmael are sent away, or whether it's God protects Hagar and Ishmael. Both are worth, worth our consideration. Both are important. Both are meaningful, particularly in our larger contexts. Not every commentator gets this passage right, either. Even Walter Brueggemann, who I hold above most others, said some things that just made me squirm around this passage. They're not easy, they're not comfortable, and it bears our thoughts. This is the second time that Hagar is leaving with her son. The first time was on her own volition, but she turned back towards the abuse that Sarah drove her out through at first. It is a hard 
re reality that these patterns and systems of abuse continue to cycle and continue to perpetuate in our world, even in our scriptures. It's something that we must come to terms with, and hopefully we reflected on last Monday during our own observances of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, sorry. The same verb used for the treatment of Sarah, uh, treatment of Hagar by Sarah that sent her away the first time is the verb that is used of the treatment of the Israelites at the hands of the Egyptians. Hagar and Ishmael did not have an easy time in this engagement, in this life, in this family situation. Not every family situation is one to be held up and celebrated. Walter Brueggemann does state that the celebration of Isaac and the anguished settlement of Ishmael are set in juxtaposition here. We have the favored son being lifted up and the son in the more complicated familial situation being cast out and driven out. The more folks that have been studying this, the more it seems that this anxiety of inheritance and the ramifications of jealousy from the problematic, of Ish problematic context of Ishmael's birth keep coming up and keep being perpetuated. Hagar and Ishmael end up returning to Egypt, which will play part in the brutalization of the Israelites, continuing these cycles of violence and abuse and just hard living in this case. It seems that generationally, people never learn what it means to care for one another, what it means to remember the humanity of others. We find it hard to separate ourselves from jealousy, whether it is a pernicious jealousy that has no roots, or whether it is that fear of scarcity that comes from not having enough. We seem to never be able to get out of these mindsets of, if we give a person some grace, they will take a mile from us, or the mindset of, we need to preserve our neighborhood, or else we will not have enough. These continue to be contexts that keep others in isolated and unforgiving situations while continuing to chip away at our souls and our ability to empathize with those around us. We can't seem to get ourselves out of these cycles of violence and self-destruction in this world. And I do believe that dehumanizing another ultimately fractures our own humanity. It's worth remembering from this past Monday's holiday, holiday that it took over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation to be violently enforced in the state of Texas so that people would no longer be legally considered others' property. And there continued to be violence backlash from that proclamation for generations afterwards, which we're still seeing the ramifications of as we as an annual conference continue to raise money for the Buffalo 10 Scholarship to hopefully create some grace out of a horrific act of violence through racism again. It is hard to figure out the narratives that will lead to generative, hopeful living out of all of this. And that's where that subtitling comes in. Is this about Hagar and Ishmael being sent out, or is this about God listening and God offering Hagar and Ishmael grace. It is a hard concept to come by that Hagar is the active protagonist, the active hero of this story, if you will. Abraham, the great uh, patriarch of so many faiths, is the bad guy here. Sarah, the one who is revered and looked up to, got it wrong and is also the bad guy here. And that's okay. It's good to recognize that not everyone gets things right all the time. It's good to recognize that there are other sources of grace, there are other people to look up to in all of the stories that we engage with. Hagar's grief is 
described vividly, encouraging compassion and empathy from each of us as we read this. It's hard not to mourn with Hagar. It's hard not to recognize that it is horrible to imagine even what she is going through. It is also very much one of the original deus ex machina moments as we find throughout so much of literary history. Right at the point of utter demise, God steps in and saves. As I reflected on this this week, I'm not sure that that happens in any point before this. In the rest of the story of Genesis leading up to this, God seems to continually be troubling things, continues to be continually scattering people so that they may hopefully find their own way back. But here seems to be one of the first ways where God hears, where God looks down and offers a source of life such that God's promises can continue in a non-destructive way. This, compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, compared to Babel, compared to the flood, compared to the exit of Eden, is such a turn for God and offers me a whole lot of comfort. God hears and saves centuries later as God hears the moans of the Hebrews in slavery. God hears the pleadings of, of Moses. God hears the prayers of Elijah and the prophets. God hears the song of Mary, continuing along to this theology that I pray about every week, reminding us that God rests on our hearts and God hears our anxieties, our joys, our relief. Frederick, Frederick Buckner uh, offered one of my favorite quotes that I came across in a commentary this week. The story of Hagar is the story of terrible jealousy of Sarah, and the singular ineffectuality of Abraham and the way of Hagar, who knew how to roll with the punches, managed to survive both of these. Above and beyond, excuse me, above and beyond that, however, it is the story of how in the midst of the whole unseemly affair, God, half tipsy with compassion, went around making marvelous promises and loving everybody and creating great nations, like the last of the big time spenders handing out hundred dollar bills. That, image, that mental image of God tipsy with compassion is one that I want to hold on to and that I pray we hold on to as well as we consider how to continue doing justice work in our communities. What does it look like for us to make these bold promises, such as God calling out great nations to be sprung forth from people? What does it look like for us to offer springs of well-being in amidst a desert of despair? What does it look like for us to provide gentle, nurturing presence when there seems to be nothing around? Another in interesting resource that I'll confess I have not ordered but looked through as many pages as Google Books would allow this week is uh, Willinda C. Gaffney's uh, Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and throne. And on page 44, she stated the following, Hagar is the mother of Harriet Tubman and women and men who freed themselves from slavery. I see Hagar as an abused woman I see God's return of Hagar to her servitude as the abuse, as the tendency of some religious communities to side with the abuser at the expense of women and children. Abraham's sexual abuse of Hagar has resonates in the sexual and reproductive uses of women's bodies in the American slaveocracy and countless other global contexts across time. These same Forces that we celebrate ending with Juneteenth are happening around the world. These same forces of dehumanization, forced servitude, forced labor are still happening even in our country. We still have work to do that we pledged to have done 260 years ago. We still have work to do 
as we continue to ensure the belovedness of each person around us. We still have work to do as we figure out how to care for each and every person in our community. As I did my own Juneteenth reflections and read through again the, the proclamation that made it a holiday, there was an Elijah Cummings quote in that document that kept coming up for me. Our children are the living messengers we send to a future we will never see. The stories that come from those younger than us are the things that will generate hope and wisdom in the future. These stories that we propagate and create are what will be the instructional pattern for generations to come. A number of the images that were flipping by and the, the cover of your bulletin is from some of my time in California. I really enjoyed my summer out there working, uh, yeah, yeah, like that. I really enjoyed my summer out there. Um, it was a lot of theater work, it was a lot of hard work, but there was also a lot of good fun with friends, which included my own journey out into the desert. It was my first journey out to the desert, so I didn't know quite how cold it would get. I tried sleeping out uh, the first night just like that and discovered I could not sleep for the cold was so biting and would not have made it through the weekend if not for the grace of some of my friends to let me into their tents. All of us, this was the first time this group of friends went camping together and kind of over-enthused about the activities that we would uh, participate in. So we brought a whole lot of beverages, but not nearly enough water, and quickly learned that that was a mistake. We all had our shorts, for it was warm in the California desert, and were very excited to run and play and hike in the hills, but none of us thought to look up what poison sumac or poison oak looked like out there, and it resulted in many of us being quite itchy. We were so excited that we extended our stay just a few more hours to be in that wonderful wilderness, but we forgot the, the treachers of the road that brought us into that particular part of Los Padres National Forest and uh, ended up with three punctured tires between the two cars on the way out, causing us to be very delayed and very tired for work the next morning. These are all wonderful stories that I share with laughter and with glee that were frustrating at the time that were examples of us very much not getting it right, that were examples of us putting ourselves at harm, and thankfully the relationships with these friends continues to be strong, but it's because we've kept talking about them, we've kept laughing about them, we've learned from these experiences which has made our future camping trips so much more pleasant and so much easier. It's continuing to tell these stories and reminding ourselves, reminding those who we tell them to, reminding other generations that we can laugh about the things that we've experienced in the past, but we ought not repeat them. We ought to learn how to equip each other with the fullness of humanity through our experiences, but we ought to offer others the grace of sharing our experiences rather than forcing them to relive and relearn those hard lessons. We ought to be able to engage with stories like these of Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, Sarah, and Abraham. And note, as important as they are to the founding of these great religious traditions, that they are not perfect, that they are to be taken with some skepticism, such that we can learn how to live in better relationships with each other, such that we can learn to better care for those around us through these mistakes of our forebears. We are called to learn from Abraham and Sarah so that we may better resemble God who hears our cries in our best and in our worst moments. So with that, our awkward hymn for the day. I always have to have one of them as an awkward hymn. It'll be in the, the blue hymnal, it'll be number 506, Wellspring of Wisdom. 
I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing together. Lord, we bring this morning our offering of our time, our talent, and our treasure. We know they're not sufficient, that we know that they cannot do on their own what is needed by you. May your love, may your guidance, may your nudging enable us to make a difference. Amen. Four announcements. It's getting near summer, so I even noticed the newsletter was down by a page or two when I put it together. So there's just a few things. Today uh, is the up uh, Joel's church. Center Brunswick. Center Brunswick is, I believe, still has their tag sale and bake sale and stuff on. Nancy and I were there um, on uh, Friday. That looked pretty good. Um, Sidewalk Warriors continues on Thursday. Bible study or uh, work. Book study. I may have gotten the page numbers wrong. I realize that as I look over this after typing that in far too early this morning. The description Ron has in the newsletter is uh, far more appropriate uh, and better than my memory. <laughs> That's pretty scary to think so, <laughs> that your memory is, that mine is better than yours. Uh, that is, Nancy is chuckling. Nancy, anything that today? No, Nancy's no, not waving. Um, Paul, do you want to talk about the meeting here tomorrow at 5? Yes, uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock, uh, we're having a meeting here with the uh, uh, Detroit uh, community police officer. Um, one, of a, uh, one of our neighbors uh, approached me the other day and had some concerns about some uh, illicit activity that was starting to take root or possibly starting to take root uh, around the church property. So Paul, myself, uh, our neighbor, are going to be... Uh, sitting down with uh, the community police officer tomorrow to see uh, what we can do to uh, be proactive and make sure that our community is, uh, is safe and, and sound. And also if there's a way to provide uh, any needed support to, uh, you know, to help uh, those 
uh, those, uh, those individuals. If anybody has any questions, you can come up to me after church. I can talk more about it. Thank you. Feel free to come by tomorrow at 5. Or, or come by tomorrow at 5 if you'd like to engage in the conversation. A uh, reminder, we got St. Paul's Strawberry Social after service today. Immediately after. Anything else? Electronics, any tech, anything up there? No? All right, with that, then our closing hymn is number 2153. I'm going to live so God can use me. Be on the screens. As we go forth today, may we go forth with the assurance that God uses our stories, that God uses our experiences, that God uses us to shape and teach each person we interact with. May we go forth to share our stories such that each person may be filled with the wholeness of life. May we go forth to share our experiences so that we can continue building a kingdom of beloved children of God, serving other beloved children of God. Let us go forth with peace this day. Amen.